Good evening, friends Good that are evening. here. God bless you. Thank you for coming. And, you know, we're giving you a night off tomorrow night. We're taking a night off, but we're going to be back here again Tuesday and Wednesday with some very important presentations. And uh, Mrs. Batchelor reminded me that not only are we translating these meetings into Spanish, there's some of the independent groups that are translating it in different languages, but I believe there's also signing. Yes, American Sign Language from the Washington Conference. So if you are interested in American Sign Language, you can go to Washington Conference Deaf Ministry through YouTube mm -hmm. and you will be able to join us. So pass it on to any of your friends that would benefit from that, but we're trying to get the message out every way we can. Amen? Amen. So tonight we're going to take some time and do some Bible questions. All right. Our first question, why does Paul say no man has seen God at any time? But then in Genesis, it says God appeared to Abraham and that Jacob saw the face of God and was preserved. That's right. Not only Abraham and Jacob, uh, Moses said, uh, Lord, let me see your glory. And God said, no man can see my face and live. And you know that story, he put Moses in the cleft of the rock and God passed by and he covered Moses with his hand. And then you've got where Manoah and his wife, when the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and he said, we've seen God and we're going to die. And she said, well, if God wanted to kill us, why would he tell us about this miracle son we're going to have? Which is good common sense. And so you've got several cases in the Old Testament where people saw the Lord. So why does Paul say no man can see, has seen God and can die? In John and John 6, yeah, and live rather. And in John 6, 46, Jesus said, no man hath seen the Father. So the member of the Godhead, Jesus, is the one that has revealed the Father to us. That's why he said to Thomas, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Christ came to reveal the Father. You and I right now in our uh, sinful state, we could not bear to look upon God's undiminished glory right now. It would vaporize us. It's just, it's hard for us to even comprehend. But uh, Jesus then communicates with us through, the Father communicates with us through the Son, you know, even when God gave the Ten Commandments, uh, the Lord descended, God and the Father and Son on the mountain when they gave the Ten Commandments, and he shielded his glory in the thunder and the clouds and the smoke and said, don't even come near the mountain. If an animal comes near the mountain, you're to kill it. And because his glory was so uh, stupendous. All right, we can also see the Father through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, he, we can uh, understand more about the personality of God. God reveals himself to us through his spirit as well. All right. Did Jesus ever marry and have children? Well, that question may be there because there have been a few movies out that seem to intimate that Jesus married. Some have speculated that he really had a secret affair with Mary Magdalene. And uh, there's not a shred of evidence in that in the Bible. Uh, Jesus did marry in the sense that he married the church. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And so when you read in Revelation, it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb and his bride has made herself ready. Who is the bride? The church. It's the church. It's a purified church. He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. She's made her garments white in the blood of the Lamb. And so metaphorically, the, the bride of Christ is the church. Jesus, he did not have any earthly wife. And that would be unkind too, you know, to get married and then know you're going to leave at 33 years of age and leave your family behind. So he knew better than to do that. All right. Is America mentioned in Bible prophecy? Yes, but you don't find the word America. Uh, but the, the nation of America is most definitely mentioned in Bible prophecy. And I know some of you would like for me to launch right now in and tell you all about it. Uh, you do find it mentioned in Revelation 13. Uh, many believe that that uh, second beast that you find in Revelation 13, 11 is speaking of the United States of America. And we're going to have a whole study. One of our studies is called America in Prophecy. You don't want to miss that presentation because it's going to be very, very relevant to what is happening in our country and the world today. So please stay tuned. All right. Who was Melchizedek, who's mentioned in Hebrews and the Old Testament? Yeah, in Genesis chapter 14, this enigmatic character suddenly appears out of nowhere called Melchizedek. And his name means uh, king of righteousness. And um, the story, Abraham 
goes to war with these five kings of the north. Chedorlaomer was the, uh, the principal king. They had conquered uh, the, the uh, valley of Sodom and the four cities of the plain, carried them all captive, and of course among them was Lot and his family. Abraham going to rescue Lot and his family, he conquered these uh, Syrian nations in, in the north, uh, rescued them, got all of the bounty of war. On his way back down to Hebron, he passed by a small city called Salem. That city called Salem was later called Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it means city of peace. And so here you've got Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem. And when he sees Abraham and his forces, he is a high priest of the city, the king of the city. He brings out bread and wine for them all. And Abraham gave him a tithe of all of the, the bounty of war, the proceeds from the war that they had recovered. And in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 7, Paul says that Melchizedek is a type of Christ. And people say, was Melchizedek a real person or was he the Holy Spirit? No, he's a real person. But Paul said he's a type of Christ in that there's no genealogy that gives him a beginning and there's no history that tells about his death. It's like he has no beginning, no end like Jesus. He's the king of Jerusalem like Jesus. His name means king of righteousness like Jesus. He goes out to Abraham and gives bread and wine. And this is what Jesus did at the Last Supper. And so in so many ways, and he's a priest like Jesus, king, priest, and so Paul is just saying he is a type of Christ. Now people say, who was he? A Jebusite, a Hittite, a Perizzite, an Amorite, a Canaanite, a Termite. What was he? <laughs> and, and so people have speculated. It doesn't say anything about that. I'll tell you one theory I think is interesting is uh, there are some, some uh, rabbis that say at the time this happened, the son of Noah, Shem, was still alive. And after he had heard that Abraham had settled in the promised land, that God had called him, and that the people around the plain of Mesopotamia were turning to idols, he then also moved his family to the land of Canaan. And they argue, who would be greater than Abraham, that Abraham would pay tithes to him and call him a priest of the Most High God? So it's an interesting argument. Shem lived uh, about 500 years, I think. So he lived a long time. Anyway, interesting study. Will God forgive me if I sin, pray for forgiveness, and then commit the same sin again? All right, they say confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. But I'm going to ask you to confess. How many of you have sinned, asked God to forgive you, and then made the same mistake? Come on, fess up. The rest of you are liars, so you're sinning. You're <laughs> <laughs> so if there's no hope for us that have been repeat offenders, anybody that struggled with an addiction, it's like Mark Twain said, quitting smoking's easy. I've done it a hundred times. Uh, you know, any struggle with any kind of addiction, uh, we know that sometimes you fall until you ultimately get the victory. And so you can't get discouraged and say, oh Lord, I already asked you to forgive me for this and I repented and I did it again. Maybe there's like, you know, three strikes and you're out. What's the rule? What did Jesus say when Peter said, how often shall I forgive my brother if he sins against me and ask for forgiveness? Seven times? What did Jesus say? 70 times, times 7. 70. Now, is God asking us to do more than he would do for each other than he would do for us? God is very patient. Now, here's the, the thing. As often as you're willing to genuinely repent, God will forgive you. But if you become presumptuous and say, well, I'm going to sin tomorrow, and then I'll just add God to forgive me before I go to sleep in case I die in my sleep. Well, you're presuming on God's grace. You're sinning, you're sinning deliberately. And what happens is you can harden your own heart and lose the capacity to be sorry for your sin. You get used to it. So that's the danger of not really, you know, grappling with and battling with the things you want to overcome. So yes, God is very, very patient and merciful, but don't take advantage and presume upon his mercy and become hardened in your sin. Well, and God can give us victory over our sin. Yeah, Bible says he cast seven devils out of Mary Magdalene and ultimately she became a faithful disciple. And he will give us victory over anything that when we're tempted, we just need to go to him and and ask him to give us uh, yeah. the victory. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yes. If the Bible says thou shalt not kill, then why did God help David kill Goliath? Yeah, not just that. Why then would God tell the 
armies of Israel to go and annihilate other kingdoms. Um, and why then do they stone those who uh, were guilty of various crimes if God says, thou shalt not kill? You know, typically when we quote the Ten Commandments, we get to that commandment and say, thou shalt not kill. It's actually not an accurate translation. When Jesus quotes the Ten Commandments in the New Testament, he says, thou shalt not commit murder. Murder is actually a very different deed than killing. If you spray your weeds in your garden, you're killing them. If you swat a mosquito, you are technically killing. And uh, you know, all, there's all kinds of killing. You eat a hamburger. <laughs> are, are you uh, a murderer? No. Murder is the unlawful taking of innocent life. We do not call soldiers murderers when they come back from defending the country. We do not call policemen murderers if they need to take life in defense of the innocent. Uh, murder is uh, unlawful taking of innocent life. So when God told David in a war to kill Goliath, that was justifiable to protect the people. What does it mean in Genesis 6 when it says, these heavenly beings married human wives and had giant children? Yeah, I, this, we get this question on our Bible Answer radio program quite a bit around the beginning of the year because people start reading their Bible and then they read these verses and they go, huh? And if you look in Genesis chapter 6, it tells us that um, after the sons of God saw the daughters of men, well, let me start with verse 1, came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days will be 120 years. And there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were mighty men who are of old, men of renown. Some people say uh, that these sons of God were angels that intermarried with humans and had these supernatural offspring. Some, but, but the problem with that is the Bible says that um, angels do not marry, neither are they given in marriage. And there's nothing that tells us angels procreate or have that kind of plumbing. And that's sort of a, a really an absurd idea. And, and then other people say, well, maybe they were aliens that came and procreated with man and had these bad children. Now, friends, let the Bible interpret itself. It, who are the sons of God? There are two ways that term is used in the Bible. Sometimes it talks about angels as sons of God because angels aren't born, they're created. But then you read in 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. When we accept the Lord, we are sons and daughters of God. And so um, in, what happened is after Cain killed Abel, Adam and Eve had another son named Seth. Adam and Eve settled not far from the Garden of Eden. This is before the flood. Cain, he went off to the land of Nod. He took one of his sisters who he married and they began to procreate. And as long as they stayed separate, those who worshiped God, Adam, Eve, Seth, and that clan, they were faithful. But when they saw the daughters of Cain, the daughters of men, the word there is enos, mortal. They're not saved. They don't have eternal life. When the children of God saw the daughters of Cain, they said, well, we know we're not supposed to intermarry. And they took them wives. Then it says, the thoughts of men's hearts were evil. I'm gonna give them 120 years. 120 years later, the flood came. Um, he said, my spirit will not always strive with man. And you might be thinking, but why does it say that their offspring were giants? Well, it's something called genetic vitality. It's a basic law of life that um, if you sometimes get fresh genes that are crossing, you're often going to have more vitality than if you just breed within the same family all the time. Hope he wasn't, won't let me mind my using him as an example. John Loma came. He's like, what, 6'3"? I don't know. His mother's John, like, John, his how mother, tall are you? How tall are you? Six, six, three. six, six, six How three. tall He's was your mom, John? Five, five feet one. <laughs> your mother is Filipino. His father's African American. It's called genetic vitality. He's taller than both. Happens all the time. If you cross a lion and a tiger, you get a liger that can be bigger than both. So this is just genetic vitality. It wasn't saying that aliens or angels got involved in this. It's saying the children of Cain married the children of uh, Seth, 
and they weren't supposed to do that, and wickedness spread through the earth. That's what happened also when God's people intermarried with pagans. So someone's going to ask, why is it that a brother and a sister could get married at that time yeah. and not at this time? The other question we get when people start reading their Bible in January is, it says Cain took his wife, and they go, Adam and Eve had uh, Abel, Cain, where'd the wife come from? They used to marry their sisters back then. Back when the genes were perfect, man had just come from the hands of God. There was no defects, no mutations, and it was allowed to marry sisters. By the time you get to Abraham, Abraham married his half-sister, Sarah, same father. Uh, and then you get to uh, Jacob, he married his first cousin. And they still do that in some states. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then by the time of Moses, it said you are not to be intermarrying with your family because God recognized there can be problems in that way. All right. Can you please explain the Trinity? Not quickly. I mean, you know, it's like uh, here we are with a few minutes talking about the, how deep is the ocean. Um, God is past finding out. The Bible says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. But we do know what is revealed, and God is three distinct persons, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You find all three entities all through Scripture, and uh, it becomes especially clear in the New Testament. Uh, let me, some people struggle with the idea that Jesus is also God, but let me just give you a few verses very quickly. In the beginning, who made the heaven and the earth? God, it says, but then you read that uh, it says, all things that were made were made by him, Jesus. Nothing was made without him that was made. The Bible says God and God only can forgive sin in the Old Testament. But does the New Testament tell us that Jesus forgave sin? And you start looking at the definitions of God. We are only to worship God, one of the Ten Commandments. But are we told to worship Jesus? So you can go back and forth through uh, dozens of different uh, identifying char characteristics of God, and you'll find that Jesus has those same characteristics. God, the Father and Son, existed before Christ was incarnate. He said, before Abraham was, I am. What's one of the titles for God? I, I am. am that I am. So, you know, I've got a little book I wrote that you can read for free at Amazing Facts website. It's called The Trinity. Is it biblical? A lot more information there. Are the 144,000 going to be the only people alive that will be saved when Christ returns? No. Um, in, in a quick answer, now you find the 144,000. They're mentioned, if you've got your Bibles, you can find them mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. And you'll also find them mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. And uh, if only 144,000 people are saved, and if there are 7.8 billion people in the world, I did the math, and I think it means one out of 50,000 people would be saved. That's like the lottery, not very good odds right? for you and me, right? Um, so fortunately, when you read in Revelation, and it talks about the 144,000, uh, it says not only are there 12,000 out of these 12 tribes, and we'll talk about that another night when we actually have a study that includes the 144,000, but John then asks, there's a great multitude that no man can number, arrayed in white robes. And he's wanting to know who are these arrayed in, right, arrayed in white robes. And the angel says, these are those who have come out of great tribulation. And so there's a great tribulation in the last days very simply, the 144,000 is 12 times 12,000. Jesus used 12 apostles that he specially trained and filled with his spirit to reach a great multitude during his first coming. But he told them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Second coming, he's going to have 12 times 12,000. They're like last day apostles that get a great multitude ready for his second coming. And so, no, they're not the only ones saved. There's something like last day apostles. Should we pray only to the Father through Jesus, or can we also pray to Jesus? That's a good question, because when you read the New Testament, uh, in most cases, you can see that uh, the prayers were directed to the Father. And Jesus said, you know, when you pray, pray in this manner, our Father. And he said, when anything you ask the Father in my name. So we pray to the Father, and we come in the name of Jesus. Or for Christ's sake, we're asking that he will hear our prayers. So what about praying directly to Jesus? Well, you've got a couple of examples in the Bible where that did happen. Um, the last words in the New Testament, last words in the Bible, even so come Lord Jesus. It's a prayer to Jesus by the Apostle John at the very end of the Bible. 
when Stephen was being stoned, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Those are the only two places I know of. If you who are watching or you who are here have some others, I, well, I'd like to see those too, but uh, I don't believe it's wrong to pray to Jesus. Often when we're teaching our children to pray, we'll say, you know, dear Jesus, we want them to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But it's also technically we're to pray to the Father in the name of the Son is how it's typically done. What is Absalom's bosom from Luke 16, 19? I think you mean Abraham's bosom? Yeah, I do. I mean <laughs> Abraham, but it kind of looks saw. like Absalom. I mean, you know, I mean, anyway. It's Absalom's Abraham. Absalom's in the lesson tonight. I think that's what that happened. Thanks. All right, Thank, it, thanks it's you. only found one place in the Bible. It talks about Abraham's bosom, and folks are wondering what that is. Is that a, is that a literal place? It is a metaphor that is used for where the saved go. Obviously, it is a symbol because, I mean, you know, uh, how many people can fit in Abraham's bosom? And even if he has a very big bosom, you know, it's not going to have that many people. So uh, it's a figure of speech because the Jews, all the Jews, um, they saw Abraham as their father. And when they were saved, it meant that they would enter into glory and be embraced by Father Abraham. So it's talking about being received in the bosom of Abraham, saved, embraced, it, it, and it's referring to the redeemed. And, I'm stuttering, sorry. Are you done? I'm done stuttering. Okay, yeah. that's good. Our last question. Okay. Should we have photos in our homes? Are those images? Yeah, there in the second commandment, it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, the likeness of anything in the heaven above. Anything. Don't have an image of anything. The earth beneath. And is that the end of the commandment? Some people say, I'm not supposed to have anything. I'm not supposed to have a photo, no facsimiles, and no anything. Uh, but the commandment doesn't stop there. The commandment goes on to say, Thou shalt not make them and bow down to them and worship them. Did God tell the children of Israel sometimes to make uh, facsimiles or uh, representations of things? He did. Did God tell Moses to make a bronze serpent? And they, he did, and people were healed when they looked at it. It was a lesson. Years later, when they started to pray to that serpent, Hezekiah said, now that's idolatry. He ground it to dust. When they built the temple, did God tell them to put angels on the Ark of the Covenant? They did. They weren't real angels. They were golden angels. Uh, when they um, built Solomon's temple, they put the laver, this big basin that held water, on 12 oxen. Well, they weren't praying to the oxen. And so it wasn't a rule that you could not have a, a recreation of anything. I think, how many of you get photos of your kids? Is that idolatry? Well, for some grandmothers, it may be. <laughs> but <laughs> they might worship <laughs> their grandchildren. But uh, it's really talking about don't make an image and bow to it. Now, to avoid people from stumbling, you've got to be careful. You know, if, if I had a big statue uh, of Jesus or Mary in the church, it, some people could be tempted to think that it's something to adore. And I think we all know there's places around the world where sincere Christians, they kneel and burn candles in front of paintings, in front of statues, and they somehow think that there's some supernatural value when they go to that place of the statue. And that's what Buddhists do. It's, that's idolatry. So we have a living God. We talk to him all the time. We don't want to uh, lower our concept of God by praying to some porcelain figure on the dashboard of our car and thinking that there's power in that. Well, friends, we have a very important study tonight. We're going to be talking about why is there evil in the world? And this is one of the big reasons that some people have problems believing in God. They say, if there is a God, if God is good, then why is there so much suffering? Why would God create this world and innocent children, innocent people suffer? If God is powerful, then why doesn't he stop the evil? If he can do anything, why doesn't he just make everybody be good and make everything peaceful and People struggle with the problem of evil. It's one of the most important questions, and I am so glad that you're here tonight. I want to welcome our friends who are watching to the Panorama of Prophecy program, and we are still uh, in the infancy of this series. You know, we have 25 total presentations in this series, and I know some people may not be able to come every night. If you miss a night, you'll be getting your lesson, but I'd come as often as you can, and I tell you there's nothing more important than what we're talking about. It's the message of God and how to live forever, what the purpose of life is, how you can be a better person, get victory over the things that trouble you in your life. Um, I'll tell you a quick testimony. I'll be sharing more about this in other 
night, but I was raised an atheist. And uh, mother's Jewish, not practicing, though. And a lot of people in Hollywood are Jewish. And father came from a uh, Baptist background, but he, he was an atheist. And uh, father had millions of dollars, owned two airlines. Uh, I got, went through the whole drug thing. There's no purpose in life. Went to 14 different schools and just trying to figure out what's going on. I found a Bible when I was living in a cave when I was 17 years old and started reading the Bible so I could argue with Christians. And it changed my life. And from that time till now, I've been going around the world sharing the good news about Jesus and teaching the Word of God. And it brings me the greatest satisfaction because I see the power of the Word to change lives. There are two titanic powers that are at war in the world today. And there's a reason that God does not just snap his fingers and annihilate Satan. And when you, under, you understand the issue, what's going on behind the scene, it begins to make a lot more sense. Our study tonight is on the Prince of Pride. And we're going to be dealing with the subject of, did God make a devil? Is there a devil? Why is there evil in the world? And as always, we like to go out on the street and find out what are some of the ideas that the general population have on these themes. So we're going to roll that at this time. I think a lot of it has to also do with things that people desire, crave, greed could be a big reason. I don't know. People do what they want to do. Uh, the they're individuals, you know? Because of our human nature uh, and how we're brought up, what our environment is, what we experience in life, that evil side of us automatically is going to come out in everyone, even the best of us. Is there really a devil? No, that I don't believe. I don't believe there's a devil. I don't believe there's really a devil. Well, if you believe in a God, you have to believe in the devil. So, I believe in a God. So, a, a devil has to exist. Yeah, I'm with him. If you believe in God, you've got to believe in the devil, because Jesus and God says there is a devil. And the devil and Satan and demons are mentioned 150 times in the Bible. Now, this is not a subject that I enjoy talking about because I'm preoccupied with the devil. As a matter of fact, I avoid ministers that want to always preach and talk about the devil. But I think it's appropriate to talk about what God talks about, and there's warnings in the Bible about the power of evil. Even professional boxers or football players, before they go to uh, engage an opponent, they sit down with a coach and they watch videos and films of the tactics of the enemy, so to speak, so they can understand what's going on. The Lord wants us to understand something about the nature and the tactics of the devil. And I can tell you the devil's not happy about this program tonight because we're going to be exposing what his plans are. The Bible tells us and Jesus warns us about that. Now, as we always do, we use Bible stories to understand these uh, theological teachings of the gospel. And tonight is no exception. We're going to look at a story that you find in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 14. It's the lesson, of course, is called the Prince of Pride. It's dealing with Absalom. Absalom, his name, it means peace of the father. We've learned shalom means peace. Abba means father or papa. And uh, so he was one of the favored sons of King David. And uh, but Bible tells us that he was handsome. He goes to great lengths to say that from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And it talks about how he had this long, luxuriant hair that would grow so much every year that uh, he would even, they'd weigh it. He had like five pounds of hair a year. You can imagine that. Obviously, I didn't get his genes. But <laughs> I found that uh, theologically, hair gets men into trouble in the Bible. Look what happened to Samson. Anyway, there's a scripture that says, go up thou bald head. That offers me hope. <laughs> it's true. Anyway, so he had this long hair, and uh, he wanted to be king. He's very, David didn't give him maybe enough discipline, and uh, he was a little pampered prince in the palace, of King David, during the glory days. He got everything he wanted. Everyone kind of adored him, and he became very self-consumed. And... Uh, 
very proud. Now he had an older brother named Amnon that was really next in line to be king. When Amnon mistreated Absalom's sister, Absalom had his brother killed. And then he fled the kingdom for a little while. Eventually he wormed his way back into the favor of his father, back into the kingdom. And then after that point, Absalom would go and um, he began to exalt himself in the kingdom. It actually says he got 50 men and horses to ride before him and say, here comes Prince Absalom and everybody, everywhere he went, it was like a parade. He was a superstar in the kingdom. Uh, he was in all the tabloids, I suppose, because of his good looks. And then when people came to King David and they needed to have some judgment issue resolved, Absalom would meet them at the gate before they got to the king and say, what's your problem? Oh, yeah, that makes good sense. I'm with you. If I was king, I would, I would judge in your favor. And he started to do what some of the politicians do, where he blew sunshine at everybody and tried to make everyone feel they were so wonderful. And he would embrace those that came to the king for judgment. And the Bible tells us, you can read in 2 Samuel 15, he did this probably for a couple of years, he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now you steal something that doesn't belong to you. He took the allegiance of the people that they should have had for the king from David, who was a good king. And they took it and he stole it for himself. Finally, when he realized that he had more support than David, it broke into an open rebellion. Absalom got some of the leaders and the generals and the people to support him. And they blew the trumpet, said Absalom is king in Hebron. And then as he was making his way to Jerusalem, a messenger told David Absalom is trying to steal the kingdom. David said, look, he's going to destroy the city. And David took some of his soldiers and his family. They fled Jerusalem. The Bible says David went up the Mount of Olives weeping. Do you know, Jesus went up the Mount of Olives weeping also, wept over Jerusalem. Finally, they engaged in battle. And, you know, like Alexander the Great, you read in the Bible, David never lost a battle. The Bible talks about David fighting with the Philistines, like Goliath, Ammonites, Edomites, Moabites, Syrians, Egyptians. He never, ever lost a battle. So it's not smart to go to battle against David. And David's smaller group of soldiers, they routed Israel and those who followed Absalom. And as they were retreating, the Bible tells us that Absalom and on his mule, he was riding through the woods and he looked back to see if he was being gained upon. And his head got stuck in a low branch, in the fork of a branch of an oak tree, he calls it a terebinth tree. And the mule went out from under him and he was left hanging between heaven and earth. You can read this here in 2 Samuel 18. The mule went under the thick boughs of a great terebinth tree and his head caught in the tear. Probably his hair got wrapped up, all that beautiful hair. See, I told you, he gets in trouble. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth. Now, before I go any farther, here you've got a picture of a son of David hanging from a tree between heaven and earth. Do you find that picture in the New Testament? And when Joab the general saw him there and he... General Joab fought with David, and he thought this young, this young spoiled brat has caused all this death in the kingdom. Even though David wanted everyone to show Absalom mercy, Joab said he's just going to cause more problems. And he took three darts and pierced his heart. Kind of like the uh, nails in the hands and feet of Jesus. See, Jesus became sin for you and me. Jesus took the evil for you and me. But the rebellion of Absalom is an allegory for something that happened in heaven. God had the highest of his creation. He was a beautiful angel and he rebelled. And let's look at the story from the lesson in our, from the um, questions we're gonna see in our lesson today. And I think we're gonna learn a lot from that. First question, what was the name of the rebellious prince in heaven and why did he rebel? You can read here in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven. Oh, what's that name? Lucifer, son of the morning. That was nothing wrong with that name. That was the first name. Lucifer, it means light bearer. And uh, he may have lived millions or billions of years before he finally rebelled. We don't know. But he was the highest of God's angels. I remember one time I was uh, on the road doing meetings like this. And Karen was not with me, so I was doing my own laundry. And and uh, I was in the laundromat waiting for my clothes to dry, which is not that exciting. I saw that there was a, a mother and 
there and with her boy, and he was playing with some cars or something on the linoleum, and I said, so, well, how are you doing? Fine, and that's a neat car, thank you. And so, what's your name? He said, Lucifer. I said, what? I thought, and he said, Lucifer. I said, oh, I'm thinking, he doesn't go to church. <laughs> Nothing technically wrong with the name, but you know, it's like not too many people want to name their kid Nero or their daughter Jezebel or their son Judas, right? You might name your dog Nero, <laughs> but I was surprised I met a kid named Lucifer. Anyway, what caused his problems? It says, you have said in your heart, I will be like the Most High. So now if you have your Bible and you turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, and you can find here where it talks about the, uh, the rebellion of, uh, of uh, Lucifer. And it tells you what, what the desire of his heart was. You go to Isaiah 14, start with verse oh, 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, he didn't betray it openly first. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars are often used to describe angels in the Bible. It tells us that in Revelation. I will also sit, meaning enthroned, on the mount of the congregation. They'll all worship me. On the farthest sides of the north, that means the highest place. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So here you've got this very powerful, not just very powerful, the most powerful angel of God. And he begins to think, God is getting all the worship. Jesus has the power to create. Why don't I have the power to create? And even though the other angels adored Lucifer and he probably led the heavenly choir, the Bible alludes to his musical ability, he began to resent that he didn't have ultimate power. It says, your heart, this is now Ezekiel 28. The prophet there tells us, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. You know, sometimes if a person is very intelligent and they're good looking and they can get a lot of praise from people and with praise, you get pride. With pride, you start wanting more and more attention and more and more power. And that's what happened. Lucifer began to resent that he was not God. He wanted the top job. And he started resenting that. And he said, if I could get all the angels to join me, my power and all the power of the angels, we could overthrow God and I could be God. Well, to you and me right now, that sounds like a ridiculous idea that the creation could somehow overthrow the creator. Now, when, he, when God knew that Lucifer was first beginning to become preoccupied with his power and his wisdom and his beauty and think that I could be God, God could have said, look, I, he's going to be a troublemaker. I'm going to snap my fingers. I'm going to blink, and he is going to just disappear. God could do that. God is all-powerful. One of the definitions of God is he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But what would the other angels think if God had said, Lucifer, you shouldn't be questioning me. Poof, there you go. Anyone else got questions? The other angels would go, oh, maybe Lucifer's right, but we better not say anything. They would have doubted the goodness of God if God had just snuffed him out when he started his rebellion. And uh, it says, because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. He had this glory, this beauty, like Absalom, went to his head. Now, I heard a pastor say one time, there's four kinds of people. You got people who are Beautiful on the inside, but they might be average. Most of us are pretty average on the outside. And even though they might just be, you know, normal on the outside, because they're beautiful on the inside, they got a winning disposition and a quick smile, and people want to be good, be with them, and they, they're good listeners. Everybody wants somebody like that, and people love those people. They're beautiful people, but they might be homely on the outside. Then you got people who are Beautiful on the outside, but they're proud on the inside. I knew this one girl, and she spent all of her spare time reading Glamour magazine, and she was a very attractive young lady, but she knew it. And she was always looking at herself, always pulling out a mirror. She could not walk by a glass window without checking herself out. 
And her friends used to tease her because she was obviously pretty preoccupied with her appearance. And guys wanted to date her, but they didn't want to marry her. It's kind of like those two guys that were sitting in church one day and in walks this man with a very beautiful wife. And they kind of all turned around and looked and he elbowed his friend. He said, that guy's wife always looks like a million dollars. He said, yeah, it's costing him a million dollars a month to keep her looking that way too. So then you got the people who are, you know, they're beautiful on the outside, but they're kind of selfish on the inside. Then you got a very rare individual that is beautiful on the outside, and they're beautiful on the inside. The Bible says a beautiful woman without discretion is like a jewel of gold in a pig's nose. Did you know that? That's what Solomon said. So if you've got a person who's beautiful on the outside, but they don't have that beauty on the inside, it's kind of wasted. But what you really want is that woman you find in... Revelation, I'm sorry, uh, Proverbs chapter 31. She's a beautiful woman and she's a, the beautiful wife, the beautiful woman, person. And same thing with men, of course. And then the fourth category we don't want to talk about, and that would be the ugly, ugly. <laughs> Inside and out. But uh, Lucifer started out beautiful, beautiful. God made him beautiful, but he made himself ugly, and that's what people need to understand. Question number two, one of the biggest questions of the night, did God make a devil or a defective angel when he created Lucifer? Well, what does the Bible say? You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. It tells us he wasn't born, he's created. You were perfect until iniquity was found in you. And some of you might be arguing, oh, no, no, Doug. You can't have it both ways. God cannot be all-knowing and all-powerful and not know that there was something defective about Lucifer. I mean, didn't God know that he would ultimately go bad? Yes, he did. Then, then why did he make him? Cause us all these problems. God needed to demonstrate what was the truth all along, that he makes his intelligent creatures perfectly free because you cannot love unless you're truly free. Now, a uh, way that I'd like to illustrate this is I'm working on an app. You didn't know that I do my own programming. And how many of you want love? Show of hands. Well, like, come on. Some of you say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. of course you want love. I like to be liked, don't you? I mean, compared with the other option, I mean, who wants to be hated? I'd rather be liked than hated, so. And we all like affirmation and appreciation and love and affection by as much as others. And so I've developed this new app to help improve our self-esteem. Good evening, Doug. Good evening, smartphone. I want to tell you something, Doug. We're all listening. I want to tell you how much I love you. It's because you're just, well, you're so lovable. Everything about you is adorable. And you're just so intelligent. You're brilliant and you're smart. And you're so good looking. It's just absolutely stunning. No, well, you've stop. Got the strength of Samson. Oh, no, got stop. The wisdom of Solomon and the courage of Elijah all wrapped up in one yeah, person. Man. Absolutely remarkable. That's why I love you, Doug. I love you. 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 Roses are red, violets are blue, and I love you. I love you, Doug. Oh, I feel so much better already. Don't you think this will sell? I've got love now. Do you think it really makes me feel better? Why? I program it to say all those things, even though they're true. I, I'm the one who made it say all that stuff, so it doesn't really love me. A smartphone doesn't love me. It's a piece of electronics. Does God want robots? No. If God had made us robots that say, I love you, God, I love you, God, I love you, God, praise you, Lord. Pray. If you're not really choosing to do it, it's not love. Forced love is not love. Forced love is sometimes called rape. It's got to be freely given. And so if God had made only creatures that would love him, it stops being real love. God made creatures free with the ability to make independent choices. And Lucifer said, I think I love myself more. And that's when everything went bad. See, God originally designed us where our greatest fulfillment comes from expressing love away from ourselves. Something was going wrong inside Lucifer because he just 
began to think about himself more than God, resent that God was getting more power and, or had more power and was receiving more adoration than him. And the compass needle flipped around and it started pointing inward. And that's when you begin to self-destruct. That's what happened to the human race, selfishness. Like one of the people on the street, that lady said, we're all prone towards evil. Anyone given enough time because of our selfishness. That's what happened to Lucifer. What finally happened? Well, Lucifer began to circulate among the angels. And when he realized he could not be God, he thought, well, I'll, I'll get the other angels to support me. Don't underestimate his power, how clever he is and how persuasive he is, because the Bible says he was able to pers persuade a third of the angels to believe him and to follow him in his rebellion. And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the, who's the dragon represent? He represents Satan. And Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. You read about this in Revelation. I told you this is a prophecy seminar. All this is going to play into prophecy. Uh, the devil is mentioned quite a bit in the book of Revelation. What powerful beings work under the devil's command? Oh, well, he's sort of just alluded to that. You can read here in uh, Revelation 12, verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Who are these stars that were following Lucifer? They're angels also. You can look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. So, most of the time when we say, well, the devil tempted me or the devil made me do this. Of course, the devil doesn't make you do anything unless you're demon-possessed. Um, I think it was Flip Wilson used to always say, the devil, devil made me do it. Uh, you can't always blame the devil. And first of all, the devil is not omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. He can't read minds and hearts. But the devil has fallen angels, his minions, probably millions of them, one-third of the angels in heaven. And if God has guardian angels for every person and there are billions of people in the world today, you know the Bible actually gives us the highest number that is found in Greek. It applies to the angels of God. 10,000 times 1,000, 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. Tries to describe this innumerable company of angels. They're described as coming in, in a cloud when Jesus returns. So God's got a lot of angels, but one third of them followed Lucifer in his rebellion. He kept saying, you know, God's not fair. We should have more freedom. We don't need God's laws to govern us. We should make our own decisions. We should have the power of God to create have our own worlds. And as he began to plant those desires in his heart, in the hearts of the other angels, by the way, what did he tell Adam and Eve? If you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. That's what he wanted. He began to plant his desires in the hearts of the other angels, and they followed him in his rebellion. Ultimately, they were cast to the earth because it was only on earth that Satan found another race of creatures <laughs> made in God's image that followed him instead of God. God said, do not eat of the tree. The word of God said, do not eat of the tree. Lucifer said, go ahead, eat of the tree. You'll be like God. Adam and Eve had to make a decision. Who do we obey? When they chose to obey Lucifer instead of God, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, whoever you obey, that's whose servant you are. The dominion of the world that Adam had received was handed over to the devil. And even Jesus calls the devil the prince of this world. So the prince of this world comes and he has nothing in me. That's why the devil said to Jesus, if you fall down and worship me, you don't need to die for this world. I'll give it to you. He claims the dominion of this world. When the devil meets God in some heavenly meeting and God said, where did you come from? God knew, but he's asking for the sake of others. He said, I came from the earth, from walking up and down and to and fro in it. It's my territory. So people say, why is there all this evil in the world? It's because our first parents made a decision not to follow God, and God, he allows things to play out. You know, we live in a country where we get to elect our leaders. And what we elect, we experience for the next four years. Good or bad, because I'm not advocating any party. It's just, you're going to live with the consequences of your choices. And that's what's happening in the world right now, is we are living out the consequences of the choices that were made by our first parents. But it's going to come to an end soon. God just wanted the whole world to see what is the result of following the devil's government. The devil said, if I was in charge, we'd be happier in the universe. God said, all right, you found a world that's listening to you. Let's see how that goes. 
And if Jesus had not come to our world to intervene, that's why we pray. See, if we don't pray, the devil's really in control of things. It's just the mercy of God that intervenes to protect. Otherwise, he'd exterminate the whole planet. You know, uh, I, I like science and black holes are kind of fascinating. Uh, it's a collapsed star and they've pretty much proven the existence of these black holes and the density of matter in a black hole is so incredibly powerful that, you know, matter creates gravitational pull. The gravitational pull of a black hole is so incredible that light, which travels 186,000 miles per second, cannot even escape. It just sucks in. And the devil is like a black hole. Everything is about me, me, me. And people who follow the devil in the world, they've got the same attitude. All of their thoughts are, how will this affect me? What's in it for me? Jesus, on the other hand, everything Jesus did was love. What's the great command? Love the Lord, love your neighbor as yourself. See, with the devil, it's you first. Everything else is secondary. With God, it's God first, it's others first, and then it's you. The devil is the polar opposite of God when it comes to values. The plan of salvation, you're born again, and instead of being controlled by selfishness, you're now controlled by love. It changes your life. The polarity is reversed, so now you, you think about others. You, you love because Jesus loves others. What methods does Satan use in his work? Question five. And I've got several answers here. I've kind of given them letters. Answer A, Satan who deceives the whole world. This is from Revelation 12, verse 9. Satan is the great deceiver. Now, you know what deception is. Deception is not just the same thing as uh, just telling a lie. Deception is when you commingle truth with error. See, in one sense, the devil's got an advantage over God because God can only use truth. God does not lie. God cannot sin. The devil can, he can tell the truth when it's to his advantage, and then he mixes in a lie. And he deceives. He wins people's support, and then he lies. He gives you, you know, 99% orange juice and one drop of strychnine. And then you're poisoned. So the devil is a great deceiver. And how much of the world does the Bible say he's deceived? The whole world. We just saw on the screen. Is there a devil? No, no, no. The devil loves that. People don't think he really exists. I should mention at this point, folks that do think of the devil got a totally distorted concept. All right, bear with me for just a moment. Close your eyes for four seconds. Just close your eyes. Picture the devil. I want you to meditate on it. But if you were to picture the devil, okay, what did you see? How many saw red leotards? <laughs> Anybody see a goatee? Any of your devils in your mind have a goatee? I see one or two goatees out there. Horns, anyone? Yeah. Pitchfork, just you know, the trident, you know, ostensibly he's supposed to cook people evenly in hell. That's why he uses that. And, and uh, got the sinister eyes. He's always got, you know, just high hairline right here. And uh, looks evil. I used to have a goatee. Somebody said, Pastor Doug, you look like the devil. That's, uh, they said, you look like a sinister minister. And I thought, that's not good for what I do, so I shaved it off. <laughs> but people have these ideas, that, and he's got goat hooves, you know, and he's got bat wings, and people say, you know, what does the devil look like? But in reality, the Bible tells us he is a beautiful angel. A lot of misunderst misunderstandings. Deceives the whole world. Jesus was tempted. The devil's a tempter. You can read answer B. He was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan. And the three principal temptations that the devil threw at Jesus cover really all the potential temptations. And in Jesus overcoming those temptations, which were the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, in his overcoming those, it's a pattern that we can be overcomers because Jesus overcame. There is no sin that you cannot overcome with Jesus' help. You can resist temptation. By the way, it is not a sin to be tempted. Was Jesus tempted? We're all tempted. We're probably tempted several times a day. That's not a sin. It's a sin when you embrace and fall into the temptation. Uh, Jesus faced temptation head on. He met it with the word of God. We're going to say more about that. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. This is an example of his deception. Now, I've been all over the world. 
And uh, it's just, uh, I'm so blessed to be able to travel and do my favorite thing and talk about God. And one of the most incredible cities, I see my friends that have been with me in India and in China over here, I'm not gonna name them because this, I don't want people to know, but they've been to Dubai a few times, one of the most incredible cities in the world. Someone took me to a um, hotel with golden toilet seats. Beautiful city. Do you know they don't have any cars in Dubai over five years old? It's against the law. They're all new cars. It's like oil money everywhere. Most expensive hotels in the world. Beautiful cities. But I've also been some cities that are, whoo, just awful mess. The devil did not show Jesus the bad cities. He showed him the good cities. He said, oh, the beautiful kingdoms of the world, they'll all be yours if you fall down and worship me. So right here, it tells us what the devil wanted. Worship me. The devil wants to be God. The Bible also tells us that they are the spirits of demons performing signs. Answer C, the devil performs miracles. His, the demons can perform miracles. So when you're trying to find out if something is true or not, do you say, well, whoever can do the most signs and wonders, they must be right? No. Can the devil do signs and wonders? You remember when uh, in the Bible, I'm assuming, Moses came in and he threw down his rod and it became a serpent. And the Pharaoh summoned his magicians. They came in, they threw down their rods. They became serpents. So the devil has a certain amount of power to create illusions. It says here, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. Now, what verse is that? Revelation 13. This is in the verse about the beast and the mark of the beast. One of the things that the devil will do to deceive people in the last days is signs and wonders, making fire come down from heaven. Now, Elijah prayed and fire came down. Three times Elijah prayed, fire came down three different times in his life. Elijah prayed and rain came down. But the Bible says that the, the devil brought fire down from heaven in the story of Job. So the devil has a certain amount of power even over the elements. Whenever there's an earthquake or a storm, everyone says, why did God do that? It's an act of God. Well, not always, friends. I mean, God has biblically sometimes manipulated the weather one way or the other to save people or to uh, judge people, but the devil can too. So he'll counterfeit some of the miracles and the power of God to deceive people. He's an accuser. He's always pointing the finger like he did at Job. Accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night. Whenever you sin, the devil will tempt you to sin, and then he will turn you in for sinning. He's the accuser of the brethren, Revelation 12, verse 10. He's a murderer. You read in the Garden of Eden there, he's the one who inspired Cain to murder his own brother. And the devil is guilty of murder all over the planet, he and his forces every single day. He's a murderer and he's also a liar. He's just an outright liar. He will tell people things uh, that just are absolutely untruth, and they believe it. When is the devil the most dangerous? Well, you can look here in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Well, the devil is the most dangerous when he uh, tries to get people to think that he's preaching the truth. Now, you realize that uh, not every minister that's out there on television is teaching the Bible. And I'll just tell you straight up, there's a lot of pastors out there that are using television to exploit people. They're doing it in the name of the Lord. They're begging for money. They're promising people all these things they're going to get. Just send my ministry money, plant that seed of faith, and watch how God is going to bless you if you send your money to me. They've had some pastors that have been caught red-handed. They had these artificial healing services. And they picked up the frequencies where the wife of the evangelist was talking to the pastor on the radio and talking about the different people she had spoken to in the lobby, and they thought he had supernatural ability. And uh, those pastors got busted, and they continued to minister, just deceiving people, taking their, taking their money. Just, uh, uh, I don't need to start reciting all the, scandal, the scandals that are out there, but the devil is the most effective when he comes as an angel of light. Didn't Jesus warn us in the last days there'll be many false prophets, many false Christs that will do signs and wonders? 
So we've got to be on our guard. I heard an interesting fact that probably one of the most uh, deadly or dangerous serial arsonists was a man named John Orr. Between 1984 and 1991, he set approximately 2,000 fires in Southern California. What's really interesting is that his job was he was a fire chief in Glendale, California. And he was the arson investigator. And everyone wondered how he was able to solve arson problems so quickly because he set many of the fires himself, made himself out to be a hero. People died. He didn't care. He kept setting fires. He's now in jail for several life sentences. The Bible talks about Jesus said, beware of what? Prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, inwardly they are ravening wolves. The devil works through religion. Did Jesus have a Judas even among the apostles? He was a thief. So don't be discouraged if you say, well, I'm not going to churches, hypocrites in the churches, all these counterfeit teachers and preachers out there that are, you know, they're making, uh, making money on religion. The devil is trying to discourage people from following Jesus by all the counterfeits. But buried in all the broken glass is the diamond. It's the truth. So don't let the devil discourage you. That's exactly what he wants to do. People look at the, the mess of the Christian religion around the world. I used to look on TV and it's in the Protestants and Catholics are killing each other in Ireland. And I said, ah, oh, Christians are all hypocrites. People all over the world do that. That's exactly what the devil wants through using wolves in sheep's clothing. Number seven, does Satan know the Bible? Oh yeah, some people think that, you know, if, uh, if you're being tempted, you're just supposed to take your Bible and you wave it at the devil, say some words, and the devil's going to run. But, you know, the devil will take your Bible out of your hand. He'll quote it back to you. The devil knows the Bible better than anybody here, including me. He's, I'm sure, got a photographic memory. Did he quote the Bible to Jesus? He did. Matthew 4, 5, one of the temptations, it says, The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, Cast yourself down, for it is written, He'll give his angels charge concerning me. He left out the part that says, to keep you in all of your ways. You're not going to be jumping off of temples. So the devil not only quotes the Bible, he knows how to misquote the Bible or take a verse out of context. But so many people out there, they think, oh, I don't need to worry about the devil because we got five Bibles in our house. As though having a Bible on the nightstand is going to protect you. No, God doesn't want the Bible on the nightstand. He wants it in your mind. Amen? Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You've got to put it in your heart. And that's what you're doing by coming to this program. We're trying to put the word of God in your heart. and It's going to make an a eternal difference in your life. Who on earth does the devil hate the most? You can read about this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. The dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, when it says the dragon, who's the dragon? That's the devil. He is enraged with the woman, he, and he goes to make war. Who's the woman? I told you Christ married the church, the bride of Christ. The devil hates Jesus' children, and he makes war with a special group. He's not worried about the ones who take the name of Jesus and don't live at all like Christ. He's especially threatened by the ones who have the testimony of Jesus, they get the faith of Jesus, and they keep the commandments of God. And he makes war against them. Now, the devil hates Jesus. He cannot reach Jesus right now, but he wants to hurt Jesus. What would hurt you more? If someone held you down and tortured you, or if they held your children down in front of you and tortured them? Wouldn't that hurt more? So the devil knows how much God loves us. God so loved us, he sent his son to save us. He wants to hurt God, and he hurts God by hurting us. He knows that evil hurts us, and he hurts God by tempting us to sin. What two deadly animals does the Bible use to portray Satan? You can read here, it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. 
So one of the characters that is often portrayed as a devil is a lion. And the other one is, you'll find this here in Revelation 12, 9, so that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Perhaps you remember there in the Garden of Eden, what medium did the devil use to speak to Eve? It was a serpent. And when Eve was going about her pleasant tasks of working in the garden, maybe she had drifted a little bit from Adam. He doesn't seem to have been there at that moment. And this beautiful hypnotic creature, you know, snakes, the way they move can sometimes be uh, rather hypnotic. You'll sometimes see them go like that before they strike at their prey. And uh, all of a sudden it's got the supernatural ability to speak. And he says, oh, he says, I, I didn't know any of the animals could speak in the garden. He says, yeah, well, I've been eating this fruit, and it does wonderful things for you. And uh, did God say that you're not allowed to eat from the trees in the garden? Oh, no, we can eat from the trees in the garden, but we're not supposed to eat from this tree, not even supposed to touch it. He said, well, die. And the serpent said, die? Well, look at me. You're not going to die. You're going to have supernatural abilities. You'll be like God if you eat it. You'll be even more beautiful. And she said, well, it seems to be working for the serpent. And she took the fruit, and then she gave it. She ate it, probably felt exhilarated for a little bit, as sin often does. It was like the little rush before the hangover. Gave it to her husband, and then they felt the chill. Their robes of light went out. They saw their nakedness. Then they're running from God. And the fruit got stuck in Adam's throat. That's why they call this an Adam's apple. Where in the Bible does it say it was an apple? It doesn't say that. But have you ever seen any picture of Adam and Eve in the garden where she is picking a peach? Pineapple, banana, pear. It's always an apple. Some traditions just don't die, right? It could have been a coconut. Wait, no, it was a unique fruit. And so, um, but the devil used this medium of a serpent and because both lions and serpents, are, you know, they, they go after prey. A serpent is cold-blooded. And uh, there are verses in the Bible that says that with the power of God that you will be able to conquer both the lion and the serpent. You will tread underfoot. And then there's that verse in Mark chapter 16 where Jesus said that through the power of the Spirit, he said, you'll be able to take up serpents. And what he meant by that is if you get bit by a serpent, you take it up, it won't harm you. This happened to Paul in the book of Acts doesn't mean we're going to go looking for snakes and let them bite us and prove that we, uh, we have supernatural power. But the devil was symbolized by the serpent. What was the curse that fell on the serpent? You will now go upon your belly, you'll eat the dust of the ground. Now, just a little amazing fact I thought you'd find interesting is all over the world we find fossil evidence of these giant flying reptiles. And even on serpents, this is a petrosaur, that one there, Wingspan of 40 feet. It's like a Cessna airplane, weighed 300 pounds. Everything changed after the flood. But uh, there were flying serpents. And this is part of the reason that all over the world you've got dragons, not just in China, but in all these different cultures, they got legends about dragons, probably because they saw some of the fossilized remains or who knows. But uh, the serpent's often portrayed as a dragon all the way from Revelation to our Genesis to Revelation. What's the only way that we can resist Satan? Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When the prodigal son came to his senses and he began his journey home, as soon as the father saw him coming, the father ran to meet him. If you've been living in the devil's territory your whole life, or if you've been wandering there, if you come to your senses and you pray and say, Lord, help me to find my way home, God will run to meet you. There's human effort involved in resisting the devil. This is what the verse says. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Three times the devil came to Jesus, and he was resisted. How, should, how did Jesus fight the assaults of the devil? All three times when Christ was tempted by the devil, Jesus answered and said, It is written. It is written. Away with you, Satan, for it is written. So what is our best weapon to fight against the devil? The promises in the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful, friends. The Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 
God brought the world into existence. He created through his word. He said, let it be, and it happened. And through the word of God, as you read it, it has power in your life. It gives you determination. It gives you strength that you will not have otherwise. It's like a sword. Paul talks about putting on the armor of God, and he says, use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Again, you can read Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And in Revelation, it talks about Jesus coming in chapter 19. He's got a sword coming out of his mouth. Now, you realize Revelation is full of symbols. When Jesus comes, he's not going to have a big old dagger sticking out of his face. It's a symbol for the sword in the mouth is what's in his mouth. The word of God, right? So Jesus even comes conquering with the word of God in his mouth. It portrays him that way. How will the final fate of Satan resemble that of Absalom? The Bible says, Then they took Absalom, and they cast him into a large pit in the woods. <laughs> Don't miss that. They took Absalom, and they did what? They cast him in a pit, and they covered it with stones. He was in an unmarked grave. Now, during his life, he was so proud, he erected a pillar to himself. It's in the Kidron Valley. We are in Israel. I've seen it several times. This is a picture of it. It's called Absalom's Pillar. Absalom was a real historical character. Its pillar is there to this day. It's in the King's Valley. You read it in the Bible, 2 Samuel 18, 18. But when he died in battle, he wasn't buried in this uh, pillar. This was just a monument to himself. He was buried in an unmarked grave in a pit. What's going to happen to the devil, according to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15? You will be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Will Satan never reappear to tempt God's people again? Once Jesus comes and he makes the new heaven and the new earth, the Bible says there's no more death or sorrow or pain or sickness. Are we going to have to worry about the devil rearing his head again? Are we going to have to worry through eternity about this experiment with sin playing itself out again? What is the promise in God's word? You read in Ezekiel 28, verse 19, the devil shall be no more forever. Won't ever have to worry about him tempting us again. And you can read in the book of Nahum 1, 9, it says affliction shall not rise up the second time. What is the only man-made thing that you're going to see in heaven? Jesus prepared mansions for us. The only man-made thing in heaven is the scars in Jesus' hands. Even after he rose from the dead, did he still have the scars? So as we go on in through eternity, we're going to be seeing the evidence of his love for us, and it's going to dissuade anybody from ever wanting to turn back to sin again. How does God feel about the destruction of the wicked? Those who follow the devil, the Bible says Satan, and those who follow Satan are cast into the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20. Does the Lord enjoy that? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, and this is Ezekiel 33, 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. And listen to the appeal of God. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? The Lord is pleading with us, please turn. I'll give you power to turn. You'll never be happy with a life of sin. Turn from your evil ways and live, for why will you die? I mean, God has set before us all two options, Jesus or the devil. There's no, Christ said, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you have not given your life to Christ, then don't say, well, I'm neutral. No, you're not neutral. Saying no to Jesus is saying yes to the enemy. You're either with God or you're against him. Moses said, you want life, good, and blessing, or death, evil, and cursing. Everybody has those two options. The only way to have life, good, and blessing is to put your life in God's hands. Amen? When David finally learned that Absalom had died hanging in a tree, pierced, how did he respond? This is question number 15. You know, when Absalom was running, you remember he was caught by the hair, and he was hanging in the tree, and Joab and his soldiers executed him. And that has uh, hearkens to another son of David that died hanging into a tree, in a tree between heaven and earth. That was pierced. And it says, when David heard this, he was deeply moved. You know, years ago, Karen and I got word that while we were overseas, one of our children died in a construction accident. 
And I can't tell you, I would not wish that grief on any human to know that suddenly, unexpectedly, a beautiful son has died. And you didn't get to say goodbye. It's heartbreaking. And David had such high hopes for Absalom. It says he went and he said, oh, he was much moved. And he went over the gate and he wept and everybody could hear him weeping. And he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, if only I had died in your place, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. You know where else you find that phrase? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus, who is a son of David, died for you and me that we might be saved from sin and from the devil. The Bible says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down having great wrath because he knows his time is short. Question is, friends, do you know the time is short? We're living right near the end of time, and soon everybody's going to have to make a decision one way or the other. Don't wait. 1 John 4.4, 4, You are of God, little children, and you've overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Don't say, how oh, it's going to be hard to follow the Lord. Life's hard. It's a lot easier following Jesus than following the devil. It's easier being on your way to the promised land than being a slave back in Egypt. Can you say amen? So will you make that decision to turn your eyes towards Jesus? Look full in his wonderful face. You know, I heard this year that this mother was out. Uh, she's working in the kitchen and washing dishes. Five-year-old was playing in the front yard. She could look out the window and try and keep an eye on him. And then all of a sudden, she heard this terrible commotion and a scream and a growl. And she looked out the window, and a mountain lion had gotten a hold of her five-year-old and was dragging him across the lawn. Well, she dropped everything and ran out. And at this point, the lion was heading for the brush and had carried the child 50 yards. She chased down the lion, jumped on the lion, and with her bare hands, she bludgeoned that lion until it let go of her child scratching up and bruising her hands in the process. And the newspapers called her a hero. But I, I think there's probably not a mother here that would not have done the same thing. Do everything they could do to save their child from the lion. Well, stronger than the hunger of, of that lion was the love of the mother. And stronger than sin and the power of the devil is God's love for you. The devil is going around like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he might devour. And our only safety is to put ourselves in the hands of Jesus. He will give his angels charge over you to watch you. There is a war in the world between good and evil. The devil has cast his vote against you. Jesus has cast his vote for you. But you have the tie-breaking vote, friends. I'd like to encourage you tonight and all those who are watching with us to join me in prayer and say, Lord, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be good. I want to be like my Savior and have that new heart and that new life. Is that your desire? Can I please pray with you for that purpose, friends? Loving Lord, we want to thank you for your blessings that you sent your Son into this world to die for our sins, to rescue us from the enemy, to give us power over the devil. We believe you're great, you love us, and you can do this. We pray you do it for each one now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.